My name is Matt Evans. I, uh, I've been invited here today by Dr. Killily from USI to give a point of reference to his talk. And he and I have spent the last 17 months together working on a project for my company, for the company that I'm advising. I represent the County Schools Insurance Group, which is a small state agency that insures and provides health benefits, uh, liability coverage, and workers' comp to school districts in, the, in Northern California. Um, a little bit about me, and uh, for 35 years, I was a law lawyer, I was a defense lawyer, I did a lot of litigation. I represented this organization and about eight other agencies in California. I also did a lot of other work, but that was on the government side. And I retired in about 2007, and I went into mediations and started to just play golf. Um, about four years ago, and I'd represented this organization for the entire time that they've been in existence, and I did uh, transactional administrative law practice for them. I advised them through some, some bumps. But about four years ago, they called me. This organization's board president called me and said, we have a problem. Um, we, we retained a, a new CEO about six months ago. He's gone. Uh, the organization has been experiencing very poor performance for the last five years, and we're starting to have uh, difficulty meeting the needs of our members. I said I'd come up and take a look. Um, and now remember, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I'm not a specialist in this area. I didn't, didn't do a lot of work in this area. But I know a lot about contracts. I know a lot about fiduciary responsibilities. I know about accountability with, with vendors because I used to represent them to do those contracts. I got up there and started looking at things, and I found out of several things. One was for the last five years, up till about 2000, the end of 2015, so from 10 to 15, they've been averaging a rate increase of 9.3%. That's an average. And at the same time, they've been incurring or, or applying um, increases in co-pays and, and in deductibles. So the out-of-pocket for the members was, was going up. At the same time, the rates were going up, and they weren't being able to sustain this. So I said I'd take a look at it. I, I, I'm retired, so I didn't want to get involved. I, I worked on it. They wanted me to help them through the rate settings, which I did. Um, we were able to bring a, a proposed rate by our actuaries from 15% down to 5% for that year. That was the 15 year. And then, um, then I said, okay, I'm done. And they called me back and asked me to come back and act as an interim uh, administrator for them. So I agreed to do that for two years. That ended in 18. And now I've, I'm involved as their consultant to build out a new uh, uh, management model and also to continue to help them in their contracting with vendors. All this leads up to the fact that when I got involved, I realized immediately that they needed to change out a lot of things. And that doesn't just mean coming in and firing everybody. What I did is I looked at it and I realized that a lot of the contracts needed to be redone. I went through a very vigorous uh, six months of renegotiations, and I got a lot of contracts redone. That's not why I'm here today. I'm here today because I identified a lot of different areas, three major ones, and the, and the one I really focused on uh, initially was pharmacy, which I'm sad to say that's the only vendor, the only incumbent vendor I let go out of the whole thing. As I got involved in it, I realized that they all, all the contracts are based on an AWP model. That's uh, average wholesale price uh, discount model. And that's pretty standard if you deal with PBMs. So I worked with our, cons our then consultant to try to get a new contract. We did an RFP. We found, um, I think, six different responses to the RFP. And we found a new PBM that was significantly better, significantly better. And we said, of money and we started to get a downward trending downward trending and I, I asked my actuary firm Foster and Foster out in Chicago to prepare this slide for me today because I didn't I'm not a mathematician but what this slide really says is over the last three and a half years we have gone we have had a we've had zero rate increases for the three years three years of zero rate increases 
At the same time, we've taken down all of the um, deductibles, co-pays, back to their original levels. We've restored all of that without any uh, increase in the, in, the, uh, in the rent. And at the same time, we've been incurring retained earnings, which means we're, we're performing way below budget. And so that's, that, that's what that chart is. The reason that that's important is that we're, we're trying to put in controls across the board. And so as I was in my second year of wrestling with the PBM issue, I found that I couldn't get answers on, on how this AWP keeps creeping. I couldn't pin them down. I couldn't pin them down on the rebates. I, I, I met with the PBMs, I met with the aggregators, I, I went through the whole thing. I, I, I was taking depositions of these people on the phone and couldn't pin them down. So I realized that I had to make a change. So I talked to the consultant at the time and we didn't have a, we didn't have a solution. So I went to an RFP for consulting services and I'd done some research earlier and I found there's at least some thinking that you can actually come down to a price per pill, price per pill. So I said, okay, let's go through the RFP process and see how many folks will do that. We had seven responses to my RFP and only one actually could produce a model that was price per pill. And so I, I met with them, contracted with them, and that was USI, Dr. Killily. And I, I, I created a relationship with them about 17 months ago. We worked with our PBM throughout the, the third year of his contract to make compliance, try to get as much compliance as we could. But during that time frame, I approached him and I said, I'm thinking of an RFP, going out and seeing who else wants to play ball, but you're my incumbent, so I'm gonna give you a chance. And if you'll work with my consultant and I, and we can make a new contract that's, that's more transparent, um, I, will, I will not go through an RFP process. And he agreed. So we took seven months. So Dr. Killily, his organization, and I, we put together uh, a contract with our PBM, and we have now established a price per pill. And that model, is, we did a repricing, and that model is significantly better than the last AWP contract I had, significantly, in the seven figures, right off the bat. Plus, it enhances the rebate recovery. So the point of my talk today is more about how to prepare you for what you're gonna hear in just a few minutes from <coughs> Dr. Killily, because it's gonna come out like drinking from a fire hose. And uh, when the first time I met him, I have to warn you, he is, he is unbelievably informed. He, he gushes information, and as hard as I tried, I, I'd have to grapple with slowing him down and, and grabbing him on certain issues. But the truth is that this is a model that works, it can be done, and I don't know of anybody else in my area, and, and we're located up in Northern California. So I have 60 different school districts that are members of our plan and, and I service. And I don't know any of my competitors or anybody that's in that whole area that's doing this. So I'm very pleased to be able to introduce to you Dr. Killily, and I, I hope you can gain something from this encounter. Quite a nice introduction, thank you. Um, as Matt said, this, this is a little bit different, so now for something completely different. Um, our approach is, in, in an overused word, different than any other consultant group in the country. Myself, uh, as mentioned, I have a PharmD at UCSF. I used to be a clinical pharmacist. I've now been in the PBM industry 25 years. Um, the elevator line is I've built two PBMs from scratch with the great teams, but I basically have been the engineer on both of them. Um, most folks who've done what I've done have retired. I, my wife won't let me retire because she doesn't want to see me that much. Um, so, so we effectively address issues in a manner which no one else in this country is doing. And a lot of what I'm trying to do is, I mean, obviously we want to build our clientele, but I really wish employers and those who pay the bills, i.e. governmental agencies, really would understand the basis of why costs are excess 
in PBM relationships. It's not that hard. It really isn't. When, when people say PBMs are hard to understand, I, I think going to the grocery store is harder, honestly, and you'll see why. It's not taking the context of the way contracts are done, it's building up your own cost models. That's the key. So that's the title slide. I hope folks can um, hope folks can see this all the way back. I didn't know the projection would be so tight. I would have done it bigger. So basically a real life situation where, where a physician calls up and says, how much does a month's worth of Lipitor generic 40 milligram cost? And you know, he wants to know how much because somebody said uh, Prolient, which is an injection for high cholesterol, is a lot more expensive than generic uh, Lipitor. Administrator goes, well, our generics are priced at AWP minus 85. That's a great deal. Physician says, well, how much does a month worth of Lipitor cost? Because you, physicians are smart. They want to understand relative cost. Well, I don't know. Let me get back to you how much it costs, but we know it's AWP minus 85. So, oh, great. I'm sure you can all read those numbers. Um, basically, when they looked at their data, this is the monthly cost uh, across the board. And it, and it ranged everywhere from, uh, oh, this is a cost per pill. Slide so bad, I gotta put my own glasses on. Uh, cost per pill ranged from 81 cents down to 37 cents. These are all the different costs. This is in three month period. The point is when you use an AWP contract and almost all PBM contracts are based on generics for AWP minus, there is no basis for your pricing. And I'll get to it a little bit later, but we've seen minus 65 contracts that have good pricing. We've seen minus 85 contracts that have terrible pricing. And my group looks at a lot of data every month, every year. And it's just unquestionable that allowing AWP discount in your PBM contract is an open field to price generics wherever they want. And that's regardless if it's a pass-through transparent contract or not. That's really the take-home message. I could sit down now. If you allow AWP pricing in your generics, and you might say, well, there's a lot of other problems with specialty and all that. We'll get to that to some extent. But the cost excess, when we look at a situation where we're trying to solve, such as with tri-counties, it's solving cost excess and eliminating unnecessary growth. And generic pricing is a massive portion of that. So um, specific statements regarding this presentation. And again, that was the only data I'm showing because I've really cut back on showing uh, you know, trend data and all that. Nothing in this presentation has anything to do with any specific PBM. And I actually, you know, I'm, no lawyer made me say that, but I want to make sure that nobody goes out of this presentation thinking that we're condemning any particular PBM. We're not. These are habits and trends that we see in PBM contracting and we do address them and cure them. So application of any statement to any given PBM is not based on this presentation. You can make your own assumptions, but I'm specifically stating nothing in this presentation is, is a statement regarding any particular PBM, client, or practice. Um, this is really for focusing on, on pricing and purchasing. There's other areas such as cl clinical analysis that are important. Every case needs to be assessed. We've certainly seen decent pricing. So we're not, we're, we're basically, I'm trying to give a general lecture, not a specific lesser, le a lecture on uh, practices. And finally, this isn't the only answer. We're, you know, I'm not up here telling you we have the cure for cancer. Um, this is just a strategy that we believe works. And like I said, I really want to have employers and governmental agencies understand that pricing is not that difficult to manage in a PBM environment. <coughs> Boy, so this present is gonna be hard for everyone. I'll just I'll speak out more then. This presentation is also based on some basic understanding of PBM relationships. You know the concept of AWP pricing, what that means, what a MAC list means, etc. So spread pricing. I don't know how many people haven't heard of spread pricing. If you get bored, you can always Google it. Uh, and spread pricing is the concept where a PBM charges the client more than what they pay the pharmacy. I don't know if that surprises anyone. It shouldn't because it's been talked about a lot in the press, but it is pervasive. It is, it is a very common practice. So in other words, for that generic Lipitor, they may charge the client $50 per script or the member $50. pharmacy $9. It's very common. Uh, and, and again, God bless them. I, this is not a condemnation of it, but there are ways to address it and cure. Um, so one of the things we try to tell employers is 
you don't buy your drugs from the pharmacies. You're buying your drugs from a PBM. And not, I'm not talking about mail order. I mean, I'm talking about in a retail environment, when the claim is being adjudicated by the PBM, you are buying your drugs from the PBM, not a pharmacy. Why? Because the pricing that the PBM charges you as an employer or a government agency is based on the PBM's contract with you. You have no contracts with pharmacies. So that allows the PBM to keep two books. You have a book where you pay the pharmacies, and you have a book where you charge the plan sponsor. And that's how it's done. The statement which I'll make, which is not going to always be super popular, is transparency and pass-through, which is a real movement. Transparency and pass-through is not a cure for excessive PBM pricing. And I know that goes against a lot of people's statements. And I'll get to why. What I'm proposing or what I'm advocating is a real fundamentalist approach to pricing. Just like you're buying your milk at the grocery store, set your pricing at $2 a gallon. I don't know how many people go to the grocery store and buy milk on a pass-through contract. Or say, okay, well, it's wholesale minus 15. I, I think that's a good deal. No, you want to know what you're paying. Another way we look at it is a trucking company. You buy your axles for $500 an axle. Well, you buy your l generic Lipitor for $14, 14 cents a pill. Same idea. When you are buying commodities, you should be pricing it on a cost per unit. And that's what we advocate. Because once you allow it to be priced at ABP minus X percent, or once you allow it in a transparent pass contract, you have no definition of what the pricing actually is. Um, oh, stop focusing on what the PBM makes. Start focusing on what you pay. I know, that, again, that's controversial. Oh, the PBMs are making all this money, and they are. But that's not the problem. Focus on what you're paying. Build your models from the bottom up, and you will lower your cost. You may hurt their earnings, you may hurt what they make, but if you build your model from a cost up, instead of worrying about how much rebates they're retending, uh, retaining, what is, how much is the spread? That's important stuff, but it should not be the basis of how you contract with a PBM. <sighs> Generic prices. Almost every contract uh, is based on AWP, and almost every pharmacy is paid by the PBM based on a MAC list, maximum allowable cost. Maximum allowable cost list is a cost per unit. Uh, lisinopril, generic atorvastatin, generic uh, fluticasone, you name your favorite generic, and we all have them, it's a cost per unit. That's how they're paying them. So why would you allow an entity to charge you as an employer differently than what they're paying the vendor? Uh, I, again, it, it, it just, uh, we've evolved into this over the years. I've been in this business, like I said, 25 years, and it's just the evolution of allowing generics to be priced at average wholesale discount. So what you do and what we advocate is setting up a contract where you have 2,700 generics listed by what we call GCN and a cost per unit. So every single drug is paid for on a cost per unit. There's a lot of value to that too for validation on claims. We'll get to that. Um, when there's multiple generic manufacturers, there's multiple AWPs. I'll show that in a second. And again, why would you allow a PBM to pay you different or charge you differently than they're paying the pharmacy? Allows excess, cost excess. And when you're trying to lower your cost, you're trying to eliminate cost excess. It's just, it says, I hate to use the overused term, but it is If you save money, the PBM is going to make less money on your account. You have to aggressively price. Oh, I was, I was uh, here's competition. I saw the John Wooden slide, so I got a, I'm a, Die-hard since birth Seahawk fan. Pete Carroll's the coach. What's his line? Always compete. Okay? If you don't have competition when you build your PBM contract, you are not going to get a good deal. It's just that plain and simple. So this idea that either a consortium or a consultant's favorite contract, no. Everything should be done on a competitive basis. But the problem is you can't develop a competitive basis until you build a basis of pricing that's objective. You can't build competition if there's not objectivity. And so what we see is, oh, I got a much better deal. I'm now getting my generics at minus 85 and instead of minus 75. Well, but that's a subjective term. There's no basis for an AWP discount. We, and, and we saw it on a very large Fortune 20 group, 
very large, where we were kicked out. We, they didn't go with us. The PBM came and improved AWP discount on the generics, I think from 78 to 85. We went back, and across the board, the cost per unit on generics went up, in spite of a better AWP discount. So until you build an objective model, you don't even know if you're getting a better deal. But once you build the objective model, then you create a competitive environment where everyone has to compete based on your objective assessment. And that really works. I mean, that, that's, that's how business is done in most, most industries, quite honestly, but not in ours. So non-competitive environments include consortiums and coalitions. And again, God bless them all. I'm not going to name any, but the consortium, the idea that I've been in business five years and I've got these great contracts and I'm going to let you in this consortium get these great contracts, there's no competition in that. And, and, on, and, and additionally, they're often based on AWP pricing. And my argument would be how are you even validating adherence or competitiveness of the process. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it, it's, it's hard trying to tell folks that things aren't being done right. But all I'm trying to advocate is objective assessment. And that's what we've done for Tri-Counties and so many groups around this country is create an objective, measurable contract. Same thing with rebate yield. When you say rebates are guaranteed at 100% of rebates, that doesn't mean anything at all. Great concept. But you have to delineate on a cost per retail, cost per 90, et cetera, how many dollars, and then you can measure it and see if it's a competitive offer. So I'm not here to really knock transparency. I mean, I've, we're, I, I got a slide coming up with mom, apple pie, and transparency. Can I interrupt? Yes. I, I think we can ham and egg this a little bit. I think this is a point that, that I did. Go ahead and use the mic. Oh. So this is a point I didn't really focus on or develop. Uh, my responsibility to the, to the folks that hired me was to answer questions. And when I went through and, and I has determined that there was no way I could get an answer on where the money was going, why we kept having this creep in our expenses when we had these negotiated agreements and it still kept fluctuating upwards. Um, that's when I took the process to Terry, to, to Dr. Killily, and we realized that we want to set up a contract where we can point to something and say that this is the, this is the, the benchmark and we can measure it, we can touch it, feel it, see it. I can tell my board what it is. And then if it starts to fluctuate, we call them on it. The other thing is we have now the tools to look at it almost daily. We, we don't do that, but we can. We will do it if we, see a, if we see movement or we see some fluctuation, we can dial right in and find out what's going on. It might have been a utilization issue, but sometimes it's just that they creep in certain pharmacies and you'll get a hit and we can stop it. Uh, that control never existed in this or the organization that I represent. It never existed before now, and it's in our contract. Now, something else that Terry didn't talk about yet is that when we negotiated, he has a, he has a bank of, of PBMs that, are, that he's established baseline prices in. So when we're negotiating with our PBM, we're basically dictating certain levels or frameworks to get to and they're, they're having to come back. So maybe you want to touch on that a little bit so. too. I, I, I advocate the power of the client. You clients have the power, you pay the bills, but you also have to set the rules. You don't play by the rules that have been set for so long. AWP discount, 100% uh, of rebates. Build your own cost model and say, this is how my business will be won. And when you do that, you will drive lower cost and you get the ability to, as Matt was saying, call up and say, hey, we're seeing a run on this, on this product. What's going on here? But until you can measure it, you can't improve it. I was going to include that's a cliche line, but if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And, and again, using wholesale discount for generics is a massive area where you can't approve. I, I want to keep moving. But competition is the driving edge. Any benefit that we look at, where's the possible savings? Uh, we've been, we've been um, accused of focusing on generics too much, and, and I stand accused, because generic drugs is where they cost excess is. There's other significant drivers, specialty drug use. Specialty drug use is cured by improved clinical management and prior authorization. You're really not going to get much better pricing. 
terms of cost excess, the massive cost excess is in generic drug pricing, and there's always cost excess in rebates because you can always do better on negotiating. So that's why we focus. I mean, we're, we, we, once we get everything cured, we're not just focusing on generics, but when, when we inherit a group, we find the cost excess exists in your generic drugs. You know, 50 cents a pill for generic Lipitor when it should be a dime, those type of things. So that's the, the purpose of this slide. And it's this, I've been using this for 10 years, still true. We've looked at stuff recently that looks worse than what we saw even five, seven years ago. This is what happens with a generic when it loses its patent. And there are ways to look at what the wholesale costs are. And for, I can basically say across the board, if a product that's high use has been out for three years, uh, you shouldn't be paying more than 20 cents a pill for it across the board. I don't care if it's generic Celebrex, uh, you know, Ezomeprazole, good old Nexium generic, you should not be paying more than that because at the wholesale level, once there are seven or nine or 12 manufacturers, the wholesale cost, not the MAC cost, not the AWP, but the cost that the pharmacies are paying drops very low. And again, PBMs pay the pharmacies based on what they're paying. They know the numbers. A lot of them own mail order. They know what the wholesale cost is, the true wholesale cost, and they add on a couple cents, and that's your price. You want to shadow price it. So this is what happens over the months. But what happens is, is that that dropping price gets, hold, gets held after, say, 12 months. And so in this case, you, you know, just to use a number, uh, originally the, the brand cost $2 a pill. Uh, it, it, it came out to about $1.60 when there's only one manufacturer for the first six months. The wholesale cost dropped. It's now down to $0.10 cents a pill wholesale. But the cost they're charging clients is still a dollar. And I, can, I know three or four drugs I could say that's still going on right now every time a generic comes off patent. Um, this is the source of it, the fact that there's multiple AWPs for all generics, you know, all you know, high-volume generics, and that's most generics. Be it like, this is lisinopril 10. Uh, left axis is cost per pill. You could roll this out to 12 or 20 on the, on the x-axis, y-axis being cost. It, it's all over the board. And again, I'm not going to get into the mechanics of why it's unprovable on AWP discount, but with this variability, it, it, it almost doesn't matter because if you look at the aggressive competitiveness, if you can get the, the drug in your contract for a dime a pill, you're going to save yourself and your members a lot of money. And we'll get to the HSA aspect of this quickly. Competition in PBM drives lower cost. But you don't have competition when things are priced subjectively. I think I've said that too many times and I've been accused of that. Um, and you can't build a, 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 a fiscal model, you can't project what future costs are unless every single item is defined objectively, every single one. So what we're seeing very frequently nowadays is consultants and PBMs come in and saying, we're going to give you massive rebates, okay? We're going to give you $1,400 per specialty drug, and it's going to double your rebates, but they're still allowing their generics to be priced at AWP. So, I'll double your rebates, but if you still allow me to price your generics AWP, I'm just going to charge more for the generics. And if you ever try to audit it, I'll show you how I'm still adhering to AWP minus 85. You have to have every single element of your cost model based on objective metrics. And then you build a competitive model, then you bid it down. That's how you save money. And again, it, it works quite well. So all fiscal elements have to. And it's not unusual for, for, for plan sponsors and God bless them, I know you're all trying to do the best you can to be amazed by big rebate offers, but if you allow your generics to still be priced on subjective terms, those bigger rebates don't matter. So here's the, here's the, this is a, if I had an hour and a half presentation, I would have brought slides showing the data. But here's some of the stuff we've seen. And we see it all the time, and, 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 and again, it, 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 my, client, my um, analyst and I are amazed at what we see sometimes. Very high uncompetitive pricing. Like I said, we've seen outrageous pricing. We've seen generic for $2 a pill recently, when at the wholesale level it's about four cents. So that's not, a, but this other stuff is way more interesting. Uh, we've seen across the board increases in cost per unit. This is by, based on any specific drug, be it lisinopril, atorvastatin, you name it. We've seen just cost creep without any change in the contract. We, we've seen it all the time. This is really common. That's a common ob uh, 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 observation. Mail order, mail order is minus 85, retail is minus 80, but the cost per pill is higher at mail order. Oh my God, how is that possible? It's possible because the AWP is a subjective element. 
That's not very uncommon, or in other words, that's quite common. So your mail order discount is better than your, than your retail discount, but your cost per pill is higher, even on the same day. We, we have a great time looking at this stuff. Very common. Um, we, uh, we, we see, uh, you know, I gotta be careful because there's not a lot of PBMs owned pharmacies, but we've seen cost per unit higher at the PBM owned pharmacy, or more frequently, higher at the PBM owned specialty pharmacy than retail in spite of a better discount. Um, the, the, we, we've seen that, that what I just mentioned earlier where the AWP discount was increased, so you went from minus 75 to minus 85, but lo and behold, almost every generic went up in price. That's, that, that one was jaw-dropping, and that was on a very large scale. Why? And again, I don't, I'm, not a, I'm not even alleging any impropriety. It's just based on the fact that the contract is delineated on the subjective terms. And, then, and last but not least, we don't see a lot of narrow networks anymore, but we used to see narrow network advocates, and when they went to the pharmacy chain from 60 to 25,000 pharmacies at better discount, we saw the cost per unit go up there as well. Keep on an objective measurable metric for all components. I think I've said that probably too many times. Um, so how do you apply objective metrics? Generics are priced at, uh, at a fixed unit price. You eliminate global pricing terms for specialty. That is very important. That's a whole other discussion. I know it just changed pages. But you don't let your contract say, specialty will be AWP minus 18. No. You get a full line item contract. And I haven't addressed brands. It is okay to have AWP discount, uh, discount for brands because there's only one AWP, there's one manufacturer. You gotta watch the source, there's some variation, but it is okay to allow single source brands to be priced at AWP. Why? Because there's only one given AWP at any point in time, plus or minus. You gotta watch your sourcing, but there's not a lot of cost excess there. But you don't let your specialty drugs be priced at globally minus 18. Line them all up. Products like Advate, which is a clotting uh, drug, um, they should be minus 50, but just because. So you need a very delineated oral generic specialty drugs, which I'll get to in a second. So you make sure you have a competitive ADV discount. One or two percent on brands doesn't save you much of anything. It's nothing to really focus on, although you just don't let it get out of control. Rebates are still a vital component. Rebates have gone up dramatically over the past couple years. I, uh, we do not chase rebates, we watch the formulary, but the same sense, getting a contract that says, client will receive 100% of rebates, and I've seen it that frank, and that doesn't mean anything. Set your minimums, dollars per script for 30 day, 90 day, mail, specialty, and make it competitive, because then you can build your competitive objective model. So once you do that, and then, and then you can start focusing on clinical programs, which again, obviously I'm not gonna talk about here. This brings me to oral cancer drugs, and this is a confusing slide. And we ha I'm surprised we haven't seen this much in the press. My, my colleague and I are trying to write an article on this. Oral cancer drugs are incredible in the cost of excess. This is generic Gleevec, imatimid, which is a fine drug, very effective drug for cancer, fairly common. And, you know, I'm not an organic chemist, but to make generic Gleevec is actually easier than making generic atorvastatin, from what I can tell. I'm a, I'm a backseat chemist, just looking at the structures. It's not a complex structure. It is special. It used to be priced at $80,000 a year. But the wholesale cost has been dropping for the past year like a rock. But we still have many, many, many PBMs charging $4,000 a month for a drug which is selling wholesale for 30 cents a pill. It sounds shocking, but it's true. And so, just like on your retail basis, you need to price your oral specialty drugs on a cost per unit basis. It's an event basis. You know, you may not have any generic Gleevec, or you may have five, but if you have five, the savings can be half a million dollars a year. So you need to st establish your contract for specialty. That's also why you don't have a global specialty discount, 75%. You wanna delineate every product. What is the discount? If it's a generic, delineate the cost per unit. So this is basically, we're still seeing people in that, in that blue box price it at thousands of dollars a month when the whole, I don't think it's down to, I think 30 cents is too low. I, I think wholesale down to about $1.90 per pill for a generic uh, amount of it. And, and again, we competitively price these drugs. We're not where I want to be. I want to get lower still, but at least we're getting below the 4,000 a month. It's a negotiation. 
but if you don't measure it, you can't negotiate it. So again, this is the one major advertising slide, which I won't dwell on. When you put a better contract in, you get a drop like a cliff. I like to say you used to pay four bucks a gallon for milk, and now you're paying two bucks a gallon. So on December 28th, you're paying two or four bucks a gallon. On December or January 4th, you're paying two bucks. The overall cost of the plan drops quickly. Hard dollar savings. And I like to also say, with specialty drugs being such a crisis, saving that much money, $100, $150 per employee per year, helps you meet the specialty drug crisis, at least for a year or two. So this, I'm going to allude to sort of what Matt was saying. We call it the calm seas. When you have your contract in objective metrics, and everything's being priced on objective measurable rates, cost per unit for all your generics, blah, 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 then you can put it in a data warehouse, take claims in, and you can do an audit within 10 minutes. We don't like the A word. It doesn't work. Go try to audit a PBM. Good luck. But we validate claims every two weeks, every month. We take the claims. Does it match the schedule? Just like you would do if you were buying truck axles or on a contracted basis for food or whatever it might be. The validation of that contract, because you have everything delineated objectively, is really simple and really prompt. And we get right on the phone if something looks different. Oh, what's going on with this? Oh, gosh, you know, oh, some... Somebody put the number in wrong. We, we don't care about the answer. We just want it fixed. And so that's how you effectively control your cost once you bring them down. It's a calm C because once you have everything measured and understood, something spikes, you instantly know what's going on. Be it a new specialty use, be it some odd product like Dermacin, which is an incredibly odd combination product, you know because if you have a calm C, you can measure everything. If you have an objective contract based on a data warehouse, which we have the best, <laughs> we have the best people, I'm so proud of them, you can measure everything instantaneously and look for movement. So therefore you got controls, and some of them is, you know, if you have a run, God forbid, on oral cancer drugs, then you can start questioning the, the clinical PAs, but if you've got pricing moving all over the place, in a calm sea is much more difficult. I'm rolling, this is the fastest I've ever gone through this. Um, Impact on medical outcomes. If you have an HSA program with a, a deductible, imagine a, a, a custodian in, 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 in a school, these hardworking people making 29000 a year. The difference between paying, say, $350 a year for your drugs versus $2,000 a year for your drugs in an HSA program. So my, my other statement would be lowering your cost per unit on generics because most chronic conditions are treated with generic drugs. So lowering your cost per treatment year is going to increase adherence and therefore affect medical outcome downstream. That's a big deal. So if you have an HSA program, it's even more important to control your, your generic drug cost. Um, I'm just going to advocate you look up this article from Annals Internal Medicine. And with all deference to our wellness people, and, and God bless you, I'm, I'm sure you have well programs and well intent. This is a study where they actually looked at wellness strategies versus lowering the cost of therapy and the effect on health outcome. Again, Annals of Internal Medicine, a lot better journal than a lot of these other things are published in. And they basically said the most effective way to increase quality of care in, in various conditions, uh, MI, asthma, is to lower the cost of the drugs. And they compared it to phone calls, nurse visits, postcards, all the favorite things we have. But if you can lower the cost of therapy and make people take their drugs, you improve outcomes better than all those other programs. And again, I'm not saying one is, you know, uh, you, you, the others aren't of value, but the highest value in this very well done study in an objective journal, you've got to watch these journals with these wellness studies coming out in these journals you've never heard of. But this is Annals Internal Medicine, and these guys really set out as an unbiased analysis. And again, lowering cost of therapy. Rebates, we already talked about. The, I mean, the one big question is 100% of what? I'm, this is going to be a two minute run through transparency. I'm all for transparency, please. I don't want any quotes. Mom, apple pie, and transparency. Who's not for transparency? But my point is that uh, pass-through PBM contracts are not a solution to the cost crisis. I'm not going to go through all these. I don't have the time to go through the reasoning. But when you still have a pass-through PBM contract and it has AWP pricing, it's not solving things. We see cast-in-stone PBM contracts that are pass-through and the pricing's still terrible. 
you have to look nowhere farther than the Medicare Part D program. And again, there's places online that have talked about this, and I don't really want to quote them because I, I don't have their permission. But we do know for a fact that the price per pill on almost all generics that the Part D program is paying is quite high, in spite of the fact that it's mandated as pass-through. Pass-through is fine. It's a great concept. Transparency is more than fine. It's a wonderful concept. But, but uh, the point is, it doesn't solve things. Now, if you have a pass-through contract that has objective metrics, so much the better. Um, Ohio is a good place to look. I quoted two headlines from the Ohio journals. Uh, they started a, pass, a mandated transparent pass-through, the state on Medicaid. Uh, these headlines were interesting from last month. They still don't understand if it saved the money. And then the PBMs found another way around it. Well, the other way around it was to pay their specialty pharmacies more money. But I, I, I encourage you to look at the entire Ohio situation because there are innovative people, but it's almost like a cat and mouse game. And you get through it by defining an objective contract. You can't escape an objective contract. It's black and white. Um, some of the factors why it doesn't work, most, mail, most large PBMs own their own mail order. So fine, I'm going to charge you what I'm paying the pharmacy. Okay? They also own their own specialty. And there's a lot of money passing back and forth. So you can pay the pharmacy a lot and actually get some back. There's a lot to, and, and again, it's all well pursued. But why not just define what you want to pay cost per unit and get, a, get, a, get away from the whole rigmarole? Here's the alternative. And, I've, I, I, and again, this is pretty much the close. Fixed unit pricing, dollar per unit on all generics, AWP discount for brands. You've got to watch your definitions. AWP discount for specialty brands with a sp specific delineated uh, price. Fix unit pricing on, on multi-source um, specialty drugs, and then and get your rebates on a, on a control metric. I do want to get to uh, this quote at the bottom, which was from a CFO of one of our clients in the Midwest. His statement was, what could be more transparent than knowing exactly the dollar per unit that my plan and my members will pay month for months to come? The ultimate in transparency is knowing your price schedule, and that's what I advocate. Here's the keys pretty much saying the same thing. I, I am redundant. Again, ask my wife. Um, that's it. Thanks for your time. Can I, I, add, can yeah. I add, oh, yes. Matt had. I, I just wanted to add one thing I forgot about. Uh, we, right after we implemented this uh, at our place, one of my staff members came in within the first month, and she just picked up her own prescription. And she said, my, no, my normal prescription price was $25. And I just went to the pharmacy and picked it up, and I thought there was a mistake. It was $4. So I know that that sounds phenomenal. That's what we're seeing as far as what's happened here with our new negotiation. Um, and I just wanted to give Terry credit for that because I don't. Yeah, I, 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 I would have mentioned also that once you establish your objective schedule, you can also negotiate those prices down, which is what we do also. But you, you have the alternative of negotiating a better discount or cost per unit, I think the latter would probably be better. Anyway, thanks, Matt. So again, I didn't mean to throw too much at everybody all at once. I see many people fall asleep. Are there any questions? Go ahead. Mike. I'd personally like to thank the World Congress for having me here today. I, I know that uh, I've learned quite a bit. Thank you. Thank you, Matt and Terry. That was very informative. I'm a little confused about a lot of this stuff, so I think I, <laughs> I have to look at your slides more carefully, and I, and I believe the slides will be available after this conference. So we There is one question. Uh, we do have a question. So I actually have three questions. It's a little weird, weird to hear myself. Um, so first question is from initial evaluation to implementation. Can you give a sense of the timeline? It, it, initial evaluation is, is prompt. We have, a, like I said, a, an incredibly great warehouse team and analysts. They've been, all been with me over 20 years. Something's wrong with them. Um, so usually we get analyzed within a month once we get data. And we don't need a lot of data. This idea that you need several years, you just need the most recent quarter, honestly, because that's your snapshot. We model it. Uh, I, I don't want to get too much into all of it, but we model it and then um, 
take it to bid. And, and again, we have five or six PBMs who understand what we do, and they respond quickly. So I'd say um, three to five months um, to implementation. Uh, gotcha. Most PBMs want at least 60 days, if not 90 days, for implementation. So it, it's about a five to six month process. But we've, we've been known to do it really quick, uh, if need be, because again, what employers need to understand is PBMs want your business. They will do what you tell them to do, but you've got to create a competitive environment and make them perform. Anyway, go ahead. Thank you. And then the second question is, since implementation of the price ceilings for those 2,700, I think you mentioned, GCNs, yeah. Yeah. have you seen aggregation of the subsequent claims data towards that ceiling? For all of the well, uh, that, well that, that's a really good question. What what we do is establish this. That it's a, basically a fixed cost per unit. They're sticking right to it. Now we see the downward drive because we renegotiate those prices every quarter, every six months, for probably 100 to 150 products like Celebrex. We drove it down below 25 cents real quick. Generic Celebrex. Um, I think generic uh, Nexium. We might have had the lowest price in the country right away. So we do drive it down, but that fixed cost per unit allows them to price right there. But those are pretty low numbers, I, I dare say. And then the last question is, as you've seen this sort of price erosion, have you also seen a resistance for any pharmacies to participate in the network? Excellent question. That is a really good question. Uh, the answer is no. Um, huh. We mandate um, basically a wide open pharmacy network. Uh, we want everything from Al's Pharmacy in Jacksonville to the big chains. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't seen pushback on it um, because you're dealing with two separate books. Pharmacy is still, and people say, why aren't you having the pharmacies pay the PB, or the PBMs pay the pharmacies less? I don't believe so. I've, I've checked on that a bit. Um, so since there are two separate books, what they pay the pharmacies, what they charge the client, all you're doing is reducing what they're, what, what they're charging the client and not affecting their global reimbursement to the pharmacies. So we have not seen erosion in network, no. Okay. Uh, good question. Thank you. No, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Those are great questions. Hearing none. Right, thank, um, thank, thank you very you much. Thank you again for, for your very enlightening information. We really appreciate that.